so far i've come across a lot of universities around the world and uh, this is the best honestly this feels no less than any world class university anywhere in the west to merge academia and industry in a very dynamic manner at the global level not just national level bringing india to the world Dr. Raul, thank you very much for coming on the Proof of Work podcast. I've known you when I was in Australia because I was uh, associated with Watson University as being part of the Board of Studies for the MBA Financial Services. I was introduced to you by Professor Said, very kind gentleman, very good scholar and professor. I got mad respect for both you and Professor Said. And then when I came last year to India, I got the invitation to come to the Global Impact Summit and I really enjoyed my stay at Watson University and then following on you gave gave me the opportunity to teach uh, your MBA students uh, at your very fascinating and very well equipped Bloomberg Finance Lab which is something that I really enjoyed teaching your MBA students introduction to blockchain and digital currencies and that gave me an opportunity to actually stay on campus which is so beautiful I love your uh, university campus and I've noticed that it's uh, grown strength by strength uh, more equipments more cricket ground as well there now so I got to I got a chance to see you work closely because you stay on campus as well and my god I've got so much respect for you you're like everywhere you basically manage the university uh, very well uh, because it's a full-fledged university so I really thank you for taking out the time to come on the proof of work podcast Dr. Rowe really appreciate it thank you very much for having me here it's of course a pleasure discussing with you now amazing so Dr. Rowe I didn't know how young you were but we've got our common friend Nishit Jain and uh, yeah. once I was interactive with the uh, Nishit in Delhi he told me how young you are you're still in your under 35 and uh, for me for somebody who's a vice president of university running a full university in India at such a young age you've accomplished a lot so i want to go right in the start though when you were a student at St Xavier's College in Mumbai what brought you to India first uh well i came to India primarily through Rotary International uh which is not the NGO i wouldn't say but this mostly a social service based organization for different aspects they normally formed by the most powerful wealthy individuals globally because they set sort of network and they also do social service like polio eradication in so one of the programs they have is the rotary youth exchange program they call RIYE and they have it across the globe so you go to a country for a year or a year and a half depends and you have to select three countries and then you get selected by that country and then you go so at that point in time i had selected to study in in india and i had given also option of south africa and taiwan but south africa was in in social conflict as usual and taiwan was having some other issue i don't recall what now something was going on and then india was an option which was appealing but then i think mohan singh was the prime minister if i remember well so being a while but uh, when i came when this they told me I will be selected and i in the university of mumbai well obviously you start googling what is what is mumbai and everything and then you come and i still remember when i first my first flight which is in an though then I think this will be add value to the conversation I came in, my, in a Lufthansa flight from Frankfurt to Mumbai and the pilot had the audacity or somewhere he thinks he had sense of humor to say that we are about to land Mumbai the weather is pretty pleasant it's only 35 degrees and 80% humidity so it looks extremely pleasant just by hearing it so obviously it, sh it, it shook you because first and foremost the weather is a radical change and a personal touch is probably height uh, I'm used to people of around six for six foot or 6.2 yeah. and suddenly I come to India and everybody's shorter than me by by far in general like about Mumbai when I landed so 
so it was a bit of a shock. So all of these cultural shocks starts, and then, well, life continues, and you get adjusted, you do everything that foreigners will do, and you do everything that foreigners will not do, and you get accustomed to the place. And progressively, I, I found, I met my wife, and I got married, which is Indian, so then I stayed in India, and, but the rest is history. I'm here now since, since 10 years, uh, a bit more than that. But yes, I'm, I'm on OCI, I have my Spanish passport, so I'm quite settled in the place. Yeah. yeah that's amazing, Dr. Rol, like, quite a journey. So your first visit to India was basically when you were coming for university. You didn't yeah. visit before. Wow. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Raul is actually a very tall person. So when I met him first time in person, uh, he can come across as a basketball player. You, do you play basketball on campus? Uh, not play on campus because if, if your students lose, then they criticize you. <laughs> got it. Got it. So basically, Dr. Raul, so I'll tell you my experience. When I was on campus, and again, beautiful campus, I think anybody who's listening, they should check out Waxen University YouTube channel and just look at the beautiful campus that they got. A lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of various sporting facilities there, including a mini golf course, which is crazy. I have, I've studied in so many, like I've studied in universities globally, NYU, University of New South Wales. I have not seen a university that has got a mini golf course. How did that happen? Uh, that's primarily because the chancellor and founder of the university, he thought that part of the corporate attire or corporate behavioral aspects that should be contained is golf. As you know, golf is a sport that is played primarily for business purposes. Yes. Uh, I mean, you know what? I don't know anybody who plays sport. Uh, play golf for getting fit. <laughs> in fact, most of those who play golf are actually not fit. So the, the mindset was about training them on how to do business in a golf course. And of course, that was the logic behind it. But yeah. then we expanded into a full-blown uh, sports complex. Now badminton uh, stadium yeah. is also there. So we have quite some facilities. Uh, and I think the students quite enjoy it. Yes. And they really add value because the sport I agree. Especially possible without keeping your physical fitness in the university. I don't think they will last too long. Yeah. Yeah, look, totally. I think sports add a lot of uh, personality and development to an individual, especially somebody who's just starting university, even if it's uh, during an MBA. Now, doctor, like you mentioned, you know, you had some cultural shocks when you came to India. What were like the challenges over the course of actually completing your undergrad at University of Mumbai? I think bureaucracy is a big, a big yeah. task, uh, especially in a state public university and such huge university like University of Mumbai, we're talking about some 200,000 odd students. I mean, it's like yeah. unrealistic. So uh, the bureaucratic processes are huge and very long to get in a simple transcript. So that is a little bit of a shocker. Then you learn with whom to speak, how to speak, to whom yeah. to bring suites, or to whom to, you know, pump a little better to get things done faster. So anyway, you, you learn the way. And I think that has been the primary factor. Other foreigners face problems with the accent, others with the teaching. Yeah. I did not have major problem with that. My problem was primarily with the administrative parts, part of the university, yeah. with everything that had to do with it. And believe it or not, that really puts a toll because from ID card to simple bus pass, you need to touch base with those guys. And they are always on the mindset of just having lunch, tea, and leaving the job as soon as Yeah. So it's a bit of a challenge that you can use and you learn. It really helped me because, well, now I'm in a university, so I know what is not to be done. And yeah. I understood what can be corrected and what kind of people are not to be hired as well. Yeah. So would it be fair to say that uh, because because of the experience that you had, was there, was that the building blocks of you wanting to get into academics and eventually be somebody who gets an opportunity to manage a university? Like, were those the building blocks or did you have a passion before that or after that? I've always been interested in, in, in behavioral psychology, primarily because of, well, interacting with people since, since uh, teenage age. And primarily I wanted to understand women, which I still don't. So <laughs> I'm still working on that. But that's, no, that's how that immature thought started they don't try to comprehend psychological mm -hmm. theories and trying to see what is what and fitting it in. So that's where it all began. Right. And as I moved forward, then merged with technology. And then I know that there was two options. Either you're going to industry, meaning corporate, so you're going to academia. But well, with a PhD, you have a, a bit of a more uh, open umbrella. Yeah. So I, I first was a, a faculty member, a professor. I used to teach and then manage a program. Uh, I used to manage the program as a, as a program director. And probably once they saw some performance happening and output coming out then they decided to you know go on escalating thing my mindset was never about managing a university as such but what 
whatever I do, even if I have to be a plumber, I have to be make sure I'm the best plumber possible for myself, not for competing with others, but for me. So at least somebody will notice at some point that I am a great plumber. Some what? point, somewhere. So it's a matter of persistence. It's not a matter of let me compete with XYZ person or XYZ university, but let me see what, what I'm made of. Anyways, I'll have to work for 40 years. I will anyways die for that. So let us see what's the best I can get out of the time. And if I fail, I fail. There's no loss anyways. As I said, all of us are going to end up in the same position. So let us see what I can do with that time. Yeah. And well, so far so good. The future is never assured. I mean, I may always fail. Uh, that is always there. But as much as it may my control, I will try to ensure that the managerial aspects are taken care of. Yeah. Within my capacity. Got it. I just have to say that uh, Dr. Raul, he's a perfectionist. The more I got to know about him, he and his office within Voxen University is one particular department that really works in a very perfectionist uh, kind of way, which is a good thing because uh, you try to keep you and the people that you manage directly at a very high standard. And that is very much required in the Indian university setting. So yeah, like I just wanted to share that experience. I do not know whether I told you. Do Dr. Raul, I'm curious to understand. So you've talked, you did your undergrad in India and then you went and did your master's and so forth uh, in Europe, in Spain, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah, so right. how was that experience? Like I I'll tell you mine. So like having lived in Australia my entire adult life and then last year coming to India, which is the country where I was born, I had a reverse culture shock. Did you had some level of reverse culture shock when you went to Spain as well, or no? Yeah, Spain, Europe, in general, is pretty slow in comparison to the Indian working system. Um, here, everything is more chop chop, and it has to be done, it has to be done now because if not, the competition will take over. Yeah, and you're gone because of the population and the companies. In Spain, I mean, I can speak for European standards, but like the particular of Spain, uh, you know, post five o'clock, I'll not be calls, weekends, not chance, uh, public holidays is everywhere. And um, if I can say an email now, why? to send it now and send it in two days. So all this mindset is there. And then because this this mindset of work life balance, so called work life balance, but that, that, that is an excuse for many not to work at the other, not the other way. And it makes a very negative role in the Jambi generations. I have I have had students abroad when I teach in foreign universities in, in Colombia or, or in or in France that come and tell me that I am experiencing many they are experiencing uh toxic productivity. And I'm just like shocked. I'm like a first year undergrad student it's talking about toxic productivity. So it's a bit fascinating and that is a mindset. However, in India, because of, again, social conditions, the competition from the school, it is quite intense. So everything has to be done. Like I have to get more percentage than you and I have to be performing better than you because I have to go to the US yeah. and, you know, get a master's yeah. degree and a US passport. And all this mindset is inbuilt in the society. I may agree, disagree with it, but it is inbuilt as a fact. So it's a cultural shock in terms of the speed in terms of, and probably the ambition. Uh, yes. Spain generally is a country which is allowed them to football, party and Chilling. Not at all much hard work in general. Not saying that the Spanish people are not hard working. Uh, I'm not talking about that particularly. Many, many are abroad working quite hard. Yeah. But in general, the population is pretty laid back. Whereas here in India, they are laid back, but they have to work, they have no choice because they have to put foot in the plate. So yeah. it's a very different ecosystem. Very, very different. And you notice that even in the aviation sector. In India, for those who are listening, who are living here or have to travel around the country, there are airlines and there are flights every like one hour, two hours, they have a flight to go somewhere. Yes. In Spain or in Europe, if you have to keep a gap sometimes in the next day. So there is no frequency. Why there's no frequency besides population is the airlines are not interested in creeping that sort of speed. They are unable to manage. Whatever you see, Delhi Airport, Mumbai Airport, they manage thousands of flights. And it's outstanding how they are able to manage yes. so many flights. Yeah. So the same, you know, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of probably adaptation. And mm. somewhere I feel that's where what is going to cause the demise of the European Union at some point. Because oh, really, they're, just, they're very sleepy and very laid back, thinking that we are creating an while the world is moving very fast and they're still there in plateau. So it's a matter of concern. But anyway, I don't have to run the European Union, so not really my concern at this point in time. <laughs> so that is the situation, Kevin. Got it, got it. Look, that's interesting. So I do not know whether I've ever told you, but in 2017, I spent one month in Spain and I traveled across Spain. I was in Marbella, Seville, Madrid, Barcelona, San Sebastian, and I loved those cities. But yeah, what I found interesting when I went to Spain, which is something Thing that I didn't know before I actually landed there is that people work like normally people work uh, morning and then during the afternoon they go back to take a nap, right? Nah, yeah, siesta. What do you yeah. call that? I forgot what it's called. Oh, siesta. Siesta, yes. So I thought that was so interesting because I wasn't introduced to that concept or ever read about it before I was coming to Spain. And I was like, dude, like this is how life should be lit. Like this is great. But I, yeah, I had a great time at Spain. When I, when I went there in 2017, there were a lot of talks that youth unemployment is a 
a lot in Spain. However, as a tourist, I didn't necessarily witness it. Maybe because, you know, I was a tourist and I only went to touristy places. But yeah, it, I mean, the impression that I got over there was that uh, it got a good work-life balance. Uh, it's definitely very different to India where everybody's working like really hard. So you think like it's a matter of concern because of the economic environment and also the technological environment that we're living in where AI is, you know, making us very productive. Well, you see, the European Union always goes into some sort of self-destruction mode. They went in 1914 and they went again in 1939 and they're going again now with Russia. So it looks like a repetition of the same story over and over. And they just don't learn. Very fascinating. Science change, people buy new people coming. Mindset doesn't change. So that's the issue. That is a big, big matter of concern, I suppose. But again, <laughs> they have to see themselves. We can only see it as outsiders. And because I'm being an outsider of, of the continent for long, being not within there, you can see what really uh, it looks like. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally with you, doctor, that, uh, you know, living outside and just having that global perspective that you also have just gives you that, I guess, nuanced view about the world, even of your home country and your naturalized country as well. It gives you that nuanced view. You appreciate the positives, but you also are not, I guess, living in a bubble where you do not call out the negatives as well. It's a balanced view that one starts appreciating. Now, massive journey studying in India, studying in Europe as well. Who were some of the teachers that deeply inspired you over the years during your time as a student? Like what qualities made them so impactful? Well, I can cite one, which I really yeah, recall. That was in St. Xavier's College, which anyways came under the University of Mumbai. Uh, St. Xavier's was known for having a substantially large center for the blind, and they used to mentor and educate basically the blind population that got into the college, which would score 99, yes, 12 and all of that. So there was one professor I remember, obviously professor means is the PhD and uh, etc. research line, going around the world in conferences, going around the country talking in different research conferences and about media, about communications, about different social sciences uh, areas. And I was quite, quite fascinated by the fact that he always needs to carry the stick because he was completely blind, not parts of the blind. And he always needs to have some help, some supporters and drivers, especially in India. So it was quite amusing. He's traveling across the globe, he's taking pleasure with it. They come into office like anybody else and he's still going around the country. And well, he has a substantial difficulty, I mean, he cannot see. So it's a tremendous limitation. So that made me sort of appreciate the kind of efforts which are required because he finished a PhD, which is a, supposed to be in, in most places a competitive uh, yes. degree. Yes. Not even by facto, like most degrees are in general. And being blind, I mean, collecting data, writing the research, traveling for the same, and with such limitations. So that sort of resilience, less teaching, and people were paying attention to you actually, because you don't have any eye contact, as you can understand, because you don't know. You can only identify the voices. Yes. And he remember out of 700 odd students, he remember every single student by name, by their voice. Oh, and wow. Amazing. It was like mind blown because the voices may look similar in different languages. Still, the kind of resilience and the kind of mm, adaptation is, let's say, different environments is quite inspirational, particularly the adaptation point where you have a substantial difficulty and limitation which you cannot get rid of. Yeah. And he's quite well known in the sector and he does all these things. I think he's retired now, but he still works around uh, with the blind population in Mumbai, which is quite, quite substantial in number. And he works with them, guides them, educates them. So he's giving that bit back to society. So I think he has some, something to look forward to some legacy. So creating yeah. that legacy, adapting yourself, and of course, giving back to society, I think is what is required. Yes. Which is what I am trying to do through the university with social, social yes. activity, social health, yeah. uh, as much as we can. Too many of them. So we do whatever we can do within our capacity. Yeah. But I think that that was one person to really remember and take well, confidence and so on. What's the name of the professor? The full form, the full form I, have to, I have to Google it for you because it's a very complex, it complex is. name. Got it, sure. Performs major difference. I have to look for the full name. But when was the last time you were connected with him? I don't know. I have been 2016, something. Got it. Did you start at Voxen at around that time? No, I started in Voxen in 20, 2020, beginning, basically 2019, to all effects. Sorry. So, so you haven't, have you, so you haven't invited him over to Voxen University and uh, told him that this is what you're doing. I mean, he must be so proud of you as well, uh, that uh, now you're managing your, like a... He normally now does not move out of Mumbai too much. I think because of rules, primarily. Yeah. So bringing him to Hyderabad may not be very, very interesting idea. But of course, I can always approach 
approaching, but at the moment I know he's, reti- he's having his retirement life in Mumbai. Yeah. So why do we stop somebody with retirement life? They have earned it. They didn't fair enough. enjoy it. Fair enough. No, no, fair enough. I appreciate that. Now, you Ed, you are a PhD in AI. As you did your PhD in AI technology, if I'm correct. Right, Professor? Yeah. That's yeah. right. Uh, See, so, and I've noticed that uh, looking at your readings before I was coming to the Global Impact Summit, and I got to know you, that uh, you advocate a lot for a human-centered approach to technology. I'd like your take on how schools can teach ethics meaningfully, uh, because it's a, ethics is a topic that is really dear to me as well. So how do you think, uh, you know, schools, whether it's, uh, you know, non-university schools, university as well, how can they teach ethics meaningfully, leveraging these technologies so that future leaders uh, can balance ethics with fulfilling stakeholder goals? Well, I think first and foremost, you have to understand whether the industry does care about ethics or not. Why I'm saying this is we teach a lot of ethics, responsibility, sustainability, DEI. We can go on throwing acronyms. But the point is, we can teach students or candidates anything. But if the corporates actually, in, in reality, in the they don't care too much about it. They care on paper, but they don't care on reality. I agree. Then students go there thinking that I'm going to be a very morally correct employee. And the company is like, wait, wait a minute. I don't need morally correct employees. I need employees who close the business. Basically, who close the deals and yeah. give me money. So I think the reverse is required, where companies stop getting involved in fraud cases constantly, as you know very well. Yes. There is a well, there is a joke. I mean, all this Forbes ecosystem uh, of or the step and the third and all of that and there's some joke going on that everybody who makes it to the Forbes cover page ends up in jail <laughs> and you realize I mean FTX and yeah. Theranos all of them back to back sure. so how do you teach I mean I can go to a class and teach ethics and tell the student no you have to do be ethical and you have to develop your own responsibility type towards the business and then suddenly another case pop where FTX was charged some yeah. massive fraud yes. so students have to make a scratch in their heads like oh, okay yeah. so I had to learn this but actually in reality it does not play out like that yeah. because people do all sorts of whimsical shady stuff yes. to get the word that yes. so instead of universities teaching and then bad thing will be implemented it should be reversed and particularly these media houses the Forbes or any other should be a bit more careful what all they put without any due diligence I don't know if you remember Theranos Elizabeth yes, Holmes do, yeah. absolutely epic I have no comments there was no grounds all the investments yeah. because that was this was in one of our classes as a, as, a, as, a, as a case as a case study and the students were asking the same how will anybody invest millions in that yeah. you get the right people on board and you do an ethical stuff and then and where you get away with it for years and you go on getting away with it and one day it bursts in your face so it is difficult to teach students because the world out there saw something else yeah. and I can go to Indian examples also as, as you well know Indian MNCs that have been recently yes. uh, allegedly committing fraud yes. so again how do I go to a class and teach very nice theories and then and the students say, but wait a minute, this company is not doing that. Why? I have no answer. Why Why means what? How will I know why they're doing that? So that's a challenge for us. You teach something that is not playing out in reality. Yeah. It's a big, big, it's a feel good, it's a feel good topic. Yeah. Everybody wants to, we, we all should be very ethical, but then but yeah, it's very different. And yeah. there are cases day after day, day after day, uh, coming out, especially from Forbes, 13 to 30. <laughs> but that's uh, it's very, very characteristic of that. Yeah. I think uh, it's very profound what you said, doctor, because uh, yeah, I do agree with you. I think the experience uh, that you narrated it's probably the same for you it, it was the same for me as well that I read all these books as a university student that uh, you know one should do this one should do that and then when I yeah. joined the workforce and uh, I have to say like Australia is comparatively a much better work culture and a much more ethical work culture there are frauds that happen over there as well but comparatively to other nations it's got there's a reason why Australia and New Zealand and other Scandinavian countries are consistently ranked as the least corrupt countries it's a better work environment from the ethics standards. But yeah, I do agree. Uh, when I went to NYU, US has got a crazy capitalist uh, incentive-based culture where because of that incentive system, frauds happen and ESG or ethics is just for feel good and, you know, just feel good corporate media strategy. And I know that most of our audiences combined are Indian audience and they might not like it, but India is filled up with fraudulent companies. And uh, so when I come to India and they perceive as crypto as something bad, which is not something thing that is looked at when you are in Australia, but you're rightly pointed out FTX was a fraud. It was a crypto exchange. It was a fraud. And there was another company
company Celsius, they both got funding from pension funds. And pension funds are known to do massive and deep due diligence uh, before they invest their retirees and pensioners money. But they also failed to do normal due diligence and, you know, g gave like checks of $100 million to these crypto companies. But then when I came to India, I'm noticing that some of the startups are also got no corporate governance. Like I wouldn't even say lack of corporate governance, no corporate governance. And uh, they raise funding from marquee venture capital investors. So I like what you said that I think a reverse is in order because students, even with limited ethical text, you know, come to the workforce thinking that, you know, this is how the world works, but it's actually not, not how it works. So I like what you said candidly about that. I'm interested to get your take because of the incentive system of capitalism and, you know, corporate enterprises. Is there hope even to teach corporate enterprises about ethics in a meaningful way? Well, we have to be willing. I think they care more about money than they care about ethics. Yeah. Ethics is very flexible. So in my experience, they all have a skeletons in the wardrobe, but they don't want to show. Yeah. So it's more about what the boundary is. I have a skeletons, but so do you. So this is what it is. So that is how they kind of, you know, wash up the hands. Yeah. And it's in ethics. I think it'll be a bit of a mockery in that case. They will take it a bit on a funny side rather than serious side. So we can teach. Of course, you can teach anything, but it will not have any expected outcome as yeah. we think. Yeah. And look, uh, this is a very tough question. And it's a question that I've asked most of my NYU professors when I was there as a student that how do we quantitatively put an aspect so that the incentive system prioritizes a balance of ethics and nobody has an answer to it. I also do not have an answer to it. But I think if we can somehow crack, if anyone can somehow crack, quantitatively putting an incentive on prioritizing ethics, we might be able to see a path to solve this problem. But I haven't met anyone that has an answer to it. And I guess it's a very complex question that if we go back to history, corruption has always existed. Nobody has found a solution to corruption if we go back in time. And we can talk over and over about it. So I'm going to stop this topic at uh, this question only. Coming back to education, doctor, which is something uh, very you are in education. It's something that I am very passionate about as well, especially since I've come to India. And actually, I want to thank Dr. Raul because if it was not for Dr. Raul, I would ne never have been a professor and been in academia at the first place. It was his invitation to make me a professor of practice at Vauxhall University that got me into academia. So thanks a lot for that. I do not know whether I've ever thanked you for that. But education is rapidly changing uh, thanks to new technologies. What innovations at Vauxhall University are you most excited about? Uh, I think probably we are aiming to make change makers, not just employees. So that the main outcome of innovations. Innovations, of course, there are activities and there are different streams for it. We can go endlessly doing a sales pitch from that. But I think that's widely available on social media. So now it's family side, all of that. But the university primary operates on a global approach, which is not about just mobility, but even that global culture through music, folklore, food, etc., etc., as well as making people understand that either you get busy living or you get busy dying. So making making sure they comprehend this fact and they work around it and uh, getting an A4 printout, they call degree, will not really add that element, but they have yeah, degrees are plenty in the world. Yes. So meaning that, and then to do that and create a true difference by observing what is happening around the globe is our actual innovative output. As I said, there are activities at the ground level which we can call innovations because, well, they are, but they are just a means to an end. The end is not that. They're just a tool. The end is something else. So that something else has to be achieved by a lot of work in and outside the university, especially from the families as well, because yeah. they can't do anything. If they are not shaping them up in the right way, then it's a no-do. And that's a bit of a challenge at times because, well, Indian culture mindset of families generally is quite conservative. So it's not very pro taking risks and becoming an entrepreneur yes. or yeah. doing new things. It's more about either public exams or getting a job and, you know, get some finance whatever that means yeah. so getting, that's a risk and for us to you know try to defy that we are taking a risk ourselves but well so far we have got a lot of criticism and at the same time a lot of outputs as well so it is quite balanced and I'm quite used to hearing parents criticizing well they don't want people to get the job they don't want people to make yeah. a difference in the world in concept. Okay. Yeah. so you go fighting it and just smile and say yes yes man thank you man and you do it still the same so that is how we normally operate it yeah no good point I, I, I agree the, like the previous generation, like our, my parents' generation, I think they were living in that socialist India era. So for them, it's like, because they were living in that era of India that didn't really promote entrepreneurialism. So that's why it was in their mindset that get a degree, get a job, and your life is set. But the world has evolved so
so much that now, even if you get a job, it doesn't guarantee you whether you can have a good work-life balance or a good standard of living, uh, good mental health. So I think that has changed. I'm curious to get your take that, yes, I, I think I agree with you as well, that families want students to get a job. But are you seeing students also that they want to get a job? Or are they coming to university, especially at an MBA level, and are like, I want to start my own startup? Because that is something that I've noticed that the younger generation in India, they all want to be startup entrepreneurs. That's what I've observed. What is your take on that? Yeah, normally we have absolutely no idea what they want to do. Yeah. Sometimes neither do professional employees anyway. They want to open a startup because they think a startup is, is very fancy, very nice to have. Yeah. You know, like at sector or three years, some out of the world. Like you can just open a startup and you will make yeah. millions in it. Yeah. Uh, obviously, that's far fetched for the truth. As I said, platforms like Forbes do not contribute to improving that. I they only push you to more startup orientation and then probably end up in fraud cases also. Yeah. So uh, they, they, they have to understand very importantly that either you're an employer or you're an employee. That's the option you're going to have ultimately. Even if you want to higher education at some point, you have to learn. So in whichever way you do it, you have to make sure that you don't end up in a situation where you are facing a lifetime injury yeah. because of your short-term greed or short-term financial aspiration. Yeah. That's where I think this current generation and probably the ones to come are suffering from which is instant gratification problems. Yes. That constantly I want things immediately and I don't want to work hard for it. Yeah. Either invest or a period of time and wait for the results. They want things like now. Yeah. And if I don't get it now, then I don't want it. So, yeah. okay, you don't want it, you don't want it. What can I do about it? But that's not how life works. And that okay. you learn probably through PhD, through marriage as well, because it's a long it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Yeah. And social media has no help, certainly. Yeah. Neither have that ecosystem of placements and that's it, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial ventures all the time. Yeah. It has not support with this mindset. And unfortunately, there's nothing to be changing it and soon, globally. But yeah. once you reach a peak and that collapses, like 2008, then people wake up suddenly. That is the issue. I can see what's going to happen. People, when they will see it only when it hits them, which is not the time to react. It's the time yeah. to act. Resolve it. That's not true. true. I'm with you. I, I'm going to share like a, a funny, uh, you know, experience that I had based on what you've said just now. It reminds me. So since coming to India, I also scout for startups to invest. And I've only invested in one startup in India called LearnApp, which you know. So I have uh, listened to like probably 100 or more than that pitches from Indian entrepreneurs where I can contribute. And uh, some of the entrepreneurs approach me. They are MBA graduates. I'm not now. I'm not going to name the business schools, but some of the top business schools, like the top, top business schools of India. They've come from there. And uh, not just one. It's happened now twice or thrice, uh, thrice to me that uh, the entrepreneurs, you know, when I'm talking to them and they are MBA graduates from these business schools, I'm asking them that, you know, how much did you invest to start this venture? And uh, they said they started this six months ago and they, you know, put like some said five lakhs, some said 10 lakhs. They put that money. And now after six months, they are now raising their pre-seed rounds or seed round, whatever terminology they want to use it. But they are raising that round to make their minimum viable product and launch it to the market. And the valuations, uh, this is last year. So at that time, we didn't have the startup winter. So they then said that uh, we are raising at a valuation of 15 crores. 15 crores for the audience outside India, it's uh, 2 million US dollars. So they they were, they were invested around uh, 20,000 US dollars. And after six months, they are raising at a valuation of uh, 2 million US dollars. So a raise of 100x. And I was, I asked them, all of them, I asked them, why is your valuation 100x after six months? Like, what did you do? All of them, this is three out of 100. So it's a rare case. But whenever I asked this question as to why 100x raise in valuation, the reply back is that 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 is the benchmark for other startups valuation in our you know category and i asked them that that is now not how you raise capital like sure some of them got lucky because we were in that you know la la land and money was cheap credit was cheap everybody was pumping in money and now we're witnessing with the high interest rate that you're not getting the capital and that's why startups are struggling but at that time they saw everybody getting money because credit is cheap and uh, so that was their answer and i told them that this is a bullshit answer because you're basically basically telling me that I'm registering a company and after six months building an MVP, now I can be a hundred X. Forget about you. I'll be the best investor if I can continue making money like that, right? That's not how capitalism or that's not how, you know, you raise money. So I totally agree with you that even graduates from the top business school got that instant gratification psychology in their mind from an entrepreneurial angle that, oh, everybody's raising money. So if I register a company, build a minimum viable product, my investment will go hundred X and I can raise money. This is not how it works, but people get there in their head.
ahead. So I totally agree with you there. Quick question, because I know that you recently wrote a book on Metaverse. And uh, it is something that I was fortunate uh, to be part of the panel with Dr. Mohan Birsani and we discussed about Metaverse last year. How do you see physical campuses evolving in the decades where virtual realities mature? Well, I wouldn't know about campuses, but if you're looking at what we can do at our end, we are doing a hybrid model. Got it. Um, primarily because all digital will not work. We have seen that during the COVID pandemic. People like to have interactions. And at the same time, they also want the best of digital. So that can be done hybrid. I'm referring particularly to fields which are more practical in nature. The sciences, engineering, architecture, design, where you can yes. digitalize products and, you know, save a lot of costs because they have no material involvement. So you can always save that cost of labs and make digital labs. Yeah. That is going to be a cost saver for, for universities big time if implemented right. But I think it will be a hybrid model because that's where we are moving. And ultimately, universities have to become not just sustainable, but also profitable. So to do that, you need to cut costs and where. Yeah. And the cost of all these materials and particularly land and real estate is shooting in the sky. So yeah. that has to be toned down at some point and digitalized quite urgently. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's very fair what you've said. Now, Dr. Raul, one thing that I got to know after coming to India and uh, being associated with your university and another business school in Delhi now, which I didn't know and probably ignorant of me that didn't do that much of research when I came to India about the education industry, but India has got the most universities than any other country in the world. I read in Statistica. India by its in 2022 had 5,318 universities, the most by any other country. Second one was US, and that was like around 3,500. Having so many universities, more than any other country in the world, how do you see the university landscape evolving? Like, are you are you gonna like are you foresighting that there is going to be consolidation in the sector? Is there going to be like reduction in the increase of university grants? How are you seeing Indian university landscape evolving? There are, there are going to be primarily uh, peers of universities, research universities, government of course, and then within the private we will have the ones which are more for placements, the ones who are more for, for USP such as globalization or project orientation. So universities have to now either dissolve and um, close shop or need a niche for them, which is not going to come because of some brand uh, or because of some corporate backing behind the scenes, because you can have all the money, but if you don't have a purpose, it's not going to really make much effect in the long yeah. run. You will run, but you will not really run. You will just operate. So that niche is required. Uh, well, part of the strategy and aesthetic management is to take a call and, and, and choose one option, not be everywhere. So that's a simple principle of a strategy that either if you want to be everywhere, you'll end up nowhere. So that's a part where you know, have to take a call, but Obviously, we are talking about 5,000 plus universities, which not all are operating at the same quality, neither. Yes, all in the same. Rural universities have a different target audience. Uh, their purpose is just to get degrees and, you know, educate people as much as possible. So, yes. very different environment. True. And very different income, of course. Economic, economic segregation is very different. Yeah, got it. Uh, I want to ask this uh, to you because I've having invested in a tech company. There is a belief within the ed tech industry that uh, the university system system of India has failed its citizens. Of course, by that, they do not mean all universities, but like the vast majority of these 5,318 universities, according to EdTech Entrepreneurs of India, believe have failed the country because they produce graduates that are unemployable and, uh, you know, it's the degrees are worthless, according to them. So they do not like to use the word degrees. They like to call themselves the skilling industry, that they are providing skills to the people. But skills are provided by university as well over time like uh, I mean I'm very I I thank what I am as an individual to the u university education that I had and I believe you as well like you would also believe that university education is important where are you in this I know you probably might be biased since you're running a university but where are you in this argument that uh, university education is not for the future future is for skilled educational centers that are teaching you skills focused on skills rather than that holistic university education? Uh, well, universities are supposed to be centers for knowledge creation and dissemination, uh, not really for jobs. Yeah. So uh, that not whether university originally was conceptualized by Socrates and Plato. Yeah. I well think right. yeah. So if we, are, if we are assuming and we are looking at it from the standpoint that universities are supposed to job, then the base of understanding that is already wrong. True. Because that's the main part. Uh, well, so it's supposed to anyhow. Now, if they don't do that, plus they don't do the other either well, then there will nothing. So that is 
is that that's when the the, the, the misunderstanding has come in the picture. Totally. Uh, students have to be an employable or an employable after a degree. They're supposed to live with certain abilities and certain understanding of the world and how to conceptualize ideas in a critical, clear, and concise manner. If they're able to do that, then university has won what it needed to do. The rest. It's up to the employer, then. They cannot, university cannot be expected to train people on the job day to day. You can yeah. only train them in some sort of chameleon uh, approach of adapting to the different environment. That's about it. Because the jobs change much faster than universities can update the curriculum because there are norms and there are yeah. regulations. Man. So the understanding, I think, stands from a from a very gray base. Where, yeah. Because, of course, it's convenient to attack companies also to make this statement because that means they are the enemy and your savior and I will give you a course. And that's about it. So it's not that I'm not saying I'm not criticizing tech and synthesis I understand the business perspective of it I know what yes. they are trying to. and from a marketing standpoint it's a smart move you're trying to put an enemy head strike yes. like, and it's just a completely that. good marketing approach yeah. but those who really know what the nurse is for is unrealistic because it does not work like that yeah. but this, anyway, this is not going to go away because again in countries like India people think degree equivalent job yes. which is not the case but you cannot change the mindset which has been put there by the parents in the first place so that will go on chilling over and over and over and then platform of different kinds will appear to like uh, there are many platforms that have come out in the picture in the last two years or that issue certifications and very, yeah. very strange esoteric whimsical stuff sure. yeah. I don't really understand how yeah. who pays for all of that exactly but somebody is there because if it's being offered means there's a customer base so yeah. that means somebody is buying all of that yeah. which is fine people's choices I, I had nothing to comment on that but as I said the marketing strategy is quite sharp and smart yeah. but biased and somewhere on fundamental and I'm not saying this because I'm in a university yeah, I'm saying this because I know the origins of of universities or morally, mostly higher education and that is how they used to operate and they yeah. don't something else but the origins were that and that were the Oxford Cambridge absolutely, the absolutely. Uh, now it's a different ball game I'm for yeah. that is what yeah. it is great answer doctor so I totally agree with you I think you articulated it so well that uh, the whole foundational assumption of this whole skilling institution versus university is flawed because if you if like you said if you look at the genesis of university university education, which goes back to the BC era. It's like uh, the whole point of education in a university environment was that you produce individuals that are well-rounded and are critical thinkers across diverse subjects, problem solvers, and so forth. Like there, It's a question that I ask even at NYU, but also with some of my colleagues in India who are pro-ed tech or are pro-university, that and nobody has the answer for this as well. Uh, I also do not have the answer, is that how do you evaluate evaluate brand equity of university brand. Like we see brand equity for Apple and all that. I'm curious why has no one done a brand equity valuation for let's say Harvard University or MIT? I do not have the answer to that. And I have never done that exercise of valuing the brand equity of these universities. But I feel that if somebody does it, the brand equity of Harvard University would be very high. It would be in billions of dollars, just like the top, uh, you know, top 50, fortune 50 companies. And if we look at as to why their brand equity is high. In my humble opinion, it's not high. I'm talking about the university, like not the business school, but like the holistic university brand. Their brand equity is not high because their job placement report is great. Like it would be a, like it would be a competent, but that would not be the reason. It's because of the history. It's because of the diverse alumni they have produced. So I'm in total agreement with you. Like this whole argument that university education, yes, it should provide, you know, a job at the end of the day. But I guess the more important reason, which is the general of creating a university structure back in history is that you produce, you know, like graduates that are well-rounded, critical thinker, problem solvers, and global citizens. So yeah, great answer, Dr. Roel. Would you agree to that uh, statement about brand equity as well? Yeah, of course. I do know Harvard and all these universities have tremendous political um, donors influence also. So a huge dichotomy behind that. So if you do it, you will see quickly you will start getting calls to stop it. <laughs> oh, 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 God. It's buying, buying or have influence. So sure. that's how primarily idyllics operate that you also know so there is nothing new in there yeah. you went to NYU you know NYU real estate in New York is tremendously high and yeah. many universities in New York are actually not profitable but yeah. it looks very fancy to have a NYU uh, a New York office or a New York campus and there are yeah. foreign universities in campus in New York also so yeah. really fancy but they don't lose actually yeah. and I know many of them sort of that so it is this is that you know it's all optics and that optic plays off very well yeah, but true. I'm not saying NYU was and I'm just giving the example that there are other yeah. foreign universities do have 
the campus in New York, yeah. which I do personally. I know about finance are not really very promising. Yeah, look, uh, I they're not necessarily about NYU, but like uh, even at Harvard University, when one looks at their finances, majority of their money comes from the investment profits they make through the endowment. Uh, yeah. So their actual academic, and you know it as well, but like for our listeners, would think that Harvard University is minting money. Yes, they do mint money, but majority of their revenue and profits come from the investment management of their multi-billion dollar endowment fund. And then a significant profit comes from the executive programs that they do for executives. But the actual university operation, it breaks even or it makes very minuscule profit, if even if it does. So yeah, good point, Dr. Rowe. I'm keen to get your take since, uh, you know, you are, you, you're constantly studying and you're constantly applying and you're at a positional power where you can experiment within your university as well. You, you get a lot of respect uh, in India and in Europe. Now globally as well, you're going to South America, you're going to US as well often. So you are considered like a very young pioneer in the education, in, in the university education industry, which is filled with mostly 60, 50 year olds. And you're this young pioneer, you know, breaking shackles on how university should be run. I want to understand that who are some of the innovative thinkers in university education that you are following? Um, see, globally, if I have to look at even some of our current partners who we know we work very closely with, and I'll tend to shape a little bit there. I don't know if you are aware of IE University in Madrid. That's IE Business School, yes. And there are universities like that, Babson College in West, doing I'm Manila in the Philippines as well. So there are very geographically placed schools who somewhere they have understood that not everything is about being an Ivy League, but taking your regional market and not just making money, but getting value out of it. And not necessarily you have to pay your professors 200,000k for teaching and doing some research research. So how do you nurture your own PhD into becoming faculty? And yeah, they will get that money, but they will get the money later. Not immediately. They have to first prove themselves and ecosystem where people don't come directly and ask for big bags like in the US. Those kind of institutions, there are more, of course, but there are, there are key institutions who are specialized in, in particular fields. Babson is in entrepreneurship yes. and there are others who are very specialized uh, in technology. We, we are looking at non being in the business school. We can look at PPH in Zurich, who is yes. very project driven. So these universities are very project driven, research oriented, and that means actual application oriented. So all those guys, they have taken over a region. They're saying that this is my region and this is my field. And as I mentioned, I have a part of the strategy is to select. So I'll say I am good in entrepreneurship and I'll do everything around it, but I'll do it only within this country or within this region in the country or in the, in the world. I will not try to be everywhere, which I think is a mistake. I think I'm making more often than not opening campuses everywhere and suddenly decentralizing efforts. What is happening when you do that is you lose control and what they do in those campuses, you actually don't know. You may have somebody that yeah, you, got, you will not have an oversight directly and you cannot go on taking flight, whatever, right? Yeah. So there yeah. has to be some textual logic and the you can see that in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, Middle East in general, all the major American yes. schools that have a campus yeah. there, including in Guadalupe. Yes, yeah. oh, yes. A lot of campus there. And yeah. I'm, I mean, it's a bit, if you think about it, people pay, ideally, people pay to go to places like Wharton or Rengway or Harvard to also go to the city, Boston, yes. New York. Yeah. I will not be too interested to do a NYU degree in Abu Dhabi. I mean, yes, nice, but not New York, right? I mean, it's yeah. not that in It's not about the city. I'm talking about the ecosystem or sure. entrepreneurship work. Yeah. So whether that will work in the long run is a business model, as you mentioned, in every brand equity. This is also a really different area to really explore whether multi-campus operations are profitable or not profitable. And does it sort of divide or segregate the brand value or yeah. does it value to it? Different ecosystems, completely different ecosystems. Yeah. And I've been wondering you it for a while because I've been to INSEAD and in, in, in Fontainebleau and I've seen the campus in Singapore as well and I have another campus in Minilista. So why so many campuses? What are you trying to achieve apart from executive education? Which is the only thing I can see the logic yeah. targeting company, lo local companies with your European or your American brand. That is what yeah. they're trying to do. Okay. But this diluting the entire image a little bit uh, from the marketing standpoint. Yeah, look, I'm totally with you and since you mentioned about NYU I can tell you that NYU some of my friends in NYU. Some of them didn't even know that NYU had a campus in Abu Dhabi. They knew that it's in Shanghai. Some of them didn't even knew that they've got a campus in Abu Dhabi. And um, I have uh, some acquaintances who were graduates from NYU Abu Dhabi. And uh, yeah, it's just totally different output. But I think it's not only with Ivy Leagues. Now coming to India and uh, having a lot of friends from Indian School of Business as well. Like ISB has got two campuses, one in Hyderabad, one in Mohali. And uh, like, I do not know whether ISB people would like this or not, but I'm just sharing my opinion based on what I've heard from 
ISB students. ISB students who graduate from Hyderabad campus, they make sure they tell people, I'm a ISB Hyderabad graduate. Even though it doesn't matter because campus is not shown anywhere when you get an ISB degree or diploma, but they make sure they tell people that they are a Hyderabad graduate because uh, I've heard that the quality of ISB Mohali isn't as great as the ISB Hyderabad one. So students, when they graduate, they actually tell, you know, people, their friends that they ensure that they are actually not Mahali graduates, they are Hyderabad graduates because the perception among the ISB crowd is that the Hyderabad campus is better than Mohali in terms of getting the quality of education. That's just my opinion based on what I've heard. Now, I have also known that having multi campuses is profitable, like when it comes to uh, Indian universities, because there is, for example, MIT University as well. They've got campuses all over India. So, like having multi campuses is profitable. But yeah, I do agree with you based on what I've heard from limited sample of network of people in India that that doesn't necessarily mean it is increasing quality. I do want to make an exception about the multi campuses one, which I have come across as SP Gen Business School. So, like their business school, they've got campuses in Sydney, they've got campuses in Dubai and Singapore. And uh, what I've heard is that they have created those campuses for their global MBA. And what I've interacted with some of the graduates from SP Gen of that global MBA cohort, they say very good things about that program and saying that having those multi campuses has really helped them to get exposure. But I think there are different ways to get that global exposure. Like I know Waxin University have got so many global partnerships where students, if they get the opportunity, they go on an exchange program. Uh, they can go to exchange program in Middle East. But uh, yeah, like that's the different uh, observations that I've got about having multi campuses from university where it can be profitable. But uh, in some cases, it's the, the brand value is diminishing because the quality is not being maintained, which is something that you were alluding to with, let's say, NYU with Abu Dhabi as well, it could be. But in some cases, it's actually enhancing the experience in the case of SP Gen, from what I've heard by some of the graduates. Yeah, yeah I agree. Now, Dr. Rowe, last question. And I appreciate like I didn't even realize we've spoken for like 17 minutes now. So I really appreciate the time that you've taken from your busy schedule. So my last question for you, I the more that I got to know you since last year, you've really you're a person who really embraces continuous life learning. And I consider myself a lifelong learner as well. I love to learn. What are you focused on learning more lately, like recently? People primarily, um, I think you never stop learning in different cultural adaptations. And somewhere the new generations always come with new new inputs for psychological theories. Uh, because somewhere I feel, you know, we are creating a slightly more stupid population in general terms. By right. stupid, I don't mean the insulting stupid, but on the, the derogatory okay. meaning yeah. of it. But mostly very laid back and not very adaptable. And as I mentioned earlier, instant gratification. And, and that can be seen in how certain universities claim to have ped pedagogical innovations, which means complex knowledge con contextualized in a very simple manner so people can understand it. And I think by doing that, you're only hurting them because you are preventing them from reading the hardcore and you're giving them a dilated version of it and basically calling them stupid and saying that you cannot understand the complex, so understand the little and let us see how that works. And I see that generation after generation because every year I welcome some yes. eight batches of different schools. So I can see the evolution and I yeah. see it abroad as well, not just in there. True. It is a diminishing. So I okay. interact a lot with cognitive psychologists like Steven Pinker or, and try to understand sharing ideas on what that you see, what is that I see, and whether it's a global tendency or it is due to Instagram or due to TikToks of the world or what is that is driving them into knocking purpose. Because then they get hooked on to video games, hooked on to snacks, hooked on to medication, and then frequently psychological counseling and goes on. So, of course, this wasn't prediction, it is to say, alcohol, drugs, etc. So, how to change that and, and of course I, I learn all the things which have to do with business uh, related as uh, administration related but that is on the job side of, of my own interest I want to understand exactly the trend and evolution because the last time that society went down happened during the substantially down happened during the Egyptians and the Greeks diminishing and the Romans what? and then we went down and completely down and then we kind of stabilized a little and towards 2000s suddenly there was an explosion of technological development yes. and now like, we are wondering whether 
while we develop technology more or is bad for us because AI will take over. So it's very funny. We want AI in, in, in 2010, 2015, everybody was like, yes, AI, let's go for AI. And suddenly we see, no, 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 AI is too dangerous. Let us not do it too fast. Let us regulate it. Let us think about ethics. I mean, <laughs> first you want it, then you don't want it. Um, you clear your mind first. These kind of confusions are not just in the media. They're inherent in people. They yeah. don't know what they want to do. And I see that in even professors globally. They are here, they're there. They don't know where they want to focus on because of various mm -hmm. facts and they are all over the place, which is dangerous because they're professors. Correct, <laughs> they're, supposed, they're supposed to be focused. If, if not the students, at least the professors. So that trying to comprehend exactly where dots connect before it hits you in the face entirely is what I try to work on. But again, uh, changes way too fast before you can really conceptualize it with data and make it theory. So it does not come as easy as got it. Wow, uh, that's a very profound statement, uh, Dr. Rao. I really appreciate you sharing about that uh, research finding. I mean, I, I, I didn't know, for example, I didn't know that uh, the last time there was like mass reduction in critical thinking was during the Egyptian and Greek era. I, so I didn't know that context. But yes, I do agree with you, having lived in Australia, lived in US and now in India, that uh, this is a global phenomena. It's uh, not a geographical centric phenomena where we are seeing not everyone, but majority, like the masses, because of this instant gratification and just content overload on your face because it's so easy to get it on one's mobile phone that it's just had a very bad psychological impact in addition to, you know, anxiety, loneliness that is well researched. Also, like the ability to critically analyze things uh, is just diminished. So I agree with that. I just want to do a quick thought, thought experiment with you since I've done it with one of my colleagues and we were just exchanging like it was a thought experiment that, hey, look, it's clear that social media has had this negative impact towards the people, which is something that we've discussed in lens uh, in this episode. But according to me, with AI technology, like, you know, let's say chat GPT-4 and whatever its upgrade happened, what's going to happen is that these algorithms are going to become more powerful because a lot of people, when they hear, let's say, a podcast, something that we talk about, or if they hear like a social media influencer, the next step that they're going to do is instead of doing a Google search, which is what they generally do, they're actually going to go to ChatGPT and feed whether this is correct or not. And those algorithms, in my experience when interacting with ChatGPT, it provides a very nuanced responses so far where it gives you A, but it also tells you it could be B as well. So it gives you both sides of the argument so far in my limited experience of interacting with ChatGPT. Whereas if you look at social media, whenever we search something, it actually validates more of our bias. I know you know this, but like just for, you know, the thought experiment, I'm giving that context that social media feeds our bias by feeding us information that we like, which may not necessarily be right because the information that it's feeding from is, uh, you know, user generated content and fake news. AI, on the other hand, in my limited experience, it gives you information that is balanced so far. But of course, the control at the end of the day is with uh, these platforms, because recently I was hearing that Baidu or one Chinese tech giant has created their chat GPT. And when you feed questions like where did COVID virus comes in, they say it comes from America blatantly, like the platform says. So the power, if chat GPT kind of platforms become more uh, popular, and if those platforms are balanced, like chat GPT-4 is at the moment, then I feel eventually people people are going to become, their, their power of becoming critical thinkers are going to increase, which has been diminished by social media. What are your thoughts on that? Like, do you think that would happen? Like, as I'm thinking. Uh, the algorithms for all these platforms are written by somebody which also has some bias. Yeah. Uh, so removing that bias is going to be difficult or impossible. So only by exposing itself to multiple interactions with different people over a period of time, mainly a sort of neutral platform may be created. Uh, whether that will increase critical thinking or not, uh, difficult to say until you see the data. Mm, yeah. It's a big assumption and I normally don't make them unless I'm really I have tested it. Of so yeah, uh, they have to be willingness from the user to actually develop because And then you can put any platforms that are required for that. But it seems like a tough affair actually, not a very easy cakewalk. Yeah, yeah, look, I, I do agree. 
agree. It's not going to be a cakewalk for sure. So Dr. Raul, look, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. This was all the long form questions that I had, but uh, the final segment of my podcast are the rapid fire questions, which are like warrants one to three word responses or a yes or no response. And they are mostly yep. playful questions. You can choose to pass some of the questions as well if you want. But I feel like knowing you, you're going to answer candidly all of those questions anyway. So if you have time, I would love to do those rapid fire questions with you. Yeah, yes. Cool. Awesome. Right. Uh, so Dr. Raul, uh, whenever you're ready, I'll start. Yeah, sure. Get us cool. go. Awesome. Cheeseburger or pizza? Pizza. Pizza. Explore Mars or explore moon? I think Mars. Moon is now Chandrayaan is there, so too overcrowded. Okay, cool. Mars. Karaoke or stand-up comedy? Comedy. Comedy, absolutely. Do you go often when you go to the city in Hyderabad to see stand-up uh, comedy? You, you do. Nothing is there. Got it. Yeah, fair enough. Do, do you have a favorite comedian? I am allowed into that humor. Like Ricky Gervais, I type of thing. Oh, yes, of course. Stream that humor or beer does if you look at the Indian Indians. Yeah, beer does is good as well. Yeah. Paperback or audiobooks? I seen paperback. Hogwarts or Jedi Academy? Not sure with the Jedi Academy. <laughs> Do you run Boxen University as a Jedi Academy and you want Jedis to come out of the business school in Oxford? No, not yet. I don't think that resemblance is there. Cool. Most underrated city, according to you? Close. In India, oh. difficult to say it. I think in India, I've seen Jai Salmar in Rajasthan. Yes. And if you look at the Spain, because when I speak to that, then you have Malaga in South Spain. Yes, yes. Well, oh, actually, Malaga reminds me. Who do you support when it comes to Spanish La Liga? Yeah, Real Madrid. Not out of course. Fair enough. Awesome. awesome. Time travel uh, in time to dinosaurs or in future to cyborgs? I about to the past. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. If you could switch lives with someone for a day, who would it be? Oh, I don't know. We think I'd say each life. Well, just for a laugh, I think, considering the kind of fun he's having now, Donald Trump may look very fun at the moment. <laughs> cool. Good answer. Good answer. Would you rather explore space or the depths of the ocean? Since I am going to Mars already, I think let's go to the ocean in this case. What is one mindset shift that changed your life? Comprehending that death is inevitable and a stable. Do what you do ultimately you want to end up there. Mm. That's deep. That's deep. It's uh, I like it. Do you, uh, I assume you do you follow Gary Vee? Uh, I know about him. I don't yeah. follow particularly. So, so Gary Vaynerchuk is somebody that I've followed since a young age, and uh, he says it often. Whenever somebody comes to ask him that you know, give me one advice that it's going to change my life and all, he says one thing: you're going to die. And uh, so I, I also do. I think that's a very uh, deep, uh, but it's a it's an important reality that one should understand. And once they understand understand it, it has a profound impact to you. I, I, I understand what you're saying. It had a profound impact to me as well uh, recently. When, yeah. Last question now, Dr. Raul. If you had unlimited power and control, what would you change about university education? I will get rid of the mindset we discussed earlier. Yeah. And focus more on the critical thinking part and less on the four job or prosper. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Raul, this was a, a very insightful, thoughtful, philosophical experience for me. I really want to thank you for taking out the time to do this. How was your experience on the Proof of Work podcast? <laughs> it was fun. fun. Of course, I always cast about different topics other than work. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Look, thanks a lot again, Dr. Raul, for taking out the time. I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to release this episode, especially for our students at Watson University who look up to you a lot. I know. So thanks a lot, Dr. Raul. Thank you very much.